Wallace with another video for virtualsheetmusic.com. Uh, today I'd like to talk about a topic um, that I, is kind of contentious, actually, um, uh, because I know it's a very, very popular idea out there, but it's an idea that I have a lot of issues with. Um, uh, I, I only recently noticed how much um, this idea has kind of entered not only into the way most people, most cellists think about cello technique, cello technique, but also the way other musicians think about cello technique. I noticed this when I was uh, watching recently the, the, the fabulous documentary uh, that the BBC did about uh, the Russian cellist Mstislav Rostropovich. I don't know if any of you have seen this, uh, this, this documentary, but it's an hour and a half long, wonderful movie. Um, uh, with uh, um, Rostropovich's family members and, and friends and colleagues um, reminiscing, and students of his re reminiscing about his life and all sorts of different footage. Well, anyway, the reason why I mention this is because uh, there's a, a little section of this documentary when the famous conductor Seiji Ozawa uh, starts talking about how Rostropovich created his sound. And first of all, I thought, well, this is a little strange. We have a conductor telling us how Rostropovich made his sound. and. And he started to say, well, you know, he, he was the one that used the weight of his arms the most in order to produce a sound. Now, um, this concept of arm weight uh, is very interesting to me because I'm not really sure that it's what's actually happening when we create a sound. It may be something that was created at some point, um, uh, uh, you know, to kind of describe a way to get power in an effortless way. But really, um, it has nothing to do with actually, you know, what we're doing when we're actually getting power um, on the cello, and it's it's kind of easy to illustrate. But first of all, to wrap up what I was saying there, it was amazing to me to hear that in that documentary, to hear Seiji Ozawa, the famous you know longtime conductor of the Boston Symphony, start talking about you know this idea of arm weight, um, because it's uh, I, I guess it's that common of an idea now uh, that that pretty much everyone talks about it now. The idea is, of course, is that you know when you're bowing, in order to get the you know, really big full sound, as in the Borjak one that really projects, that you can't press into the string. Obviously, that you have to kind of you know relax the weight of your arm to allow all the weight of the whole arm to go kind of into the string like that. Now. Let's take just a real good look at this to see if this is really what's going on because I'm pretty sure it's not. Um, if, if we just imagine, for example, the idea of arm weight being somehow transferred into the string in order to get power, um, then what we first have to think of is we have to think, okay, well that weight itself, the weight of the arm then is something that has to be kind of dead. Right, in order to be transferred into something, it can't be live. You see, if I if I if I put my arm just right above the string, then the weight of my arm is completely alive. I'm using it. There's no way it can be transferred. So then, as soon as I touch the string, then I somehow have to transfer it, or start to transfer that weight into the string. Now, if I want to transfer all of it in the string, then I have to completely have the whole system go dead. Maybe not from the back. Maybe I exaggerate a little bit, but just from the shoulder like that. Now as you can see this kind of collapsed the whole bow and then as soon as I start to draw a bow everything just kind of falls off to the side like that. So to me there, there has to be something else going on for this idea to work. And another way to illustrate this is uh, you know if we'll, we'll have the cello kind of act as a table here but you know if, if you were to imagine the concept of arm weight, the concept of arm weight would be something like okay taking um, you know the, the, the bow and, and hooking a weight or something onto the end of that bow and having that weight here somehow transfer power into something over here. Well, see, it can't happen because as soon as I put weight here, this starts to happen unless there's some type of counterbalance over here. You see what I'm saying? And so when you're bowing on the string, there's no counterbalance on the other side of the bow. There's only a little tiny, tiny bit of, I mean, we're talking about, you know, maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 grams or something of weight that's over here that's kind of balancing out the bow when we started at the frog. So that can't be happening. We can't have this kind of counterweight. See, if I had a counterweight, if I put my other hand over here, then I could kind of demonstrate that. I could kind of make both my arms go dead and create a sound that way. But we can't do that. 
obviously, because we have to be able to use our hand up here, and we can't just kind of hook a counterweight on the edge on, on, on the edge of the bow here. I may be using the wrong term counterweight there, but, but anyway, you, you understand what I'm saying. Um, it, so it just simply doesn't work like that. The way actually we get power, the way we actually get power is through torque, is through this motion this way. It's not through any sort of arm weight or anything like that. It's actually just through simply turning this way. That's all it is. So our bow hold then has to be able to go with that turning. So for example, if we hold the bow like this, you know, I don't think any cello teacher would, would let you hold the bow like this. You can't really turn. See, so you can't turn the arm. My bow hold is stopping me from turning the arm. I have to at least be here and then be able to turn that way in order to get any sort of power into the stick. Now, when you watch Rostropovich play, he does this very, very, very well. Now, he holds the ball a lot deeper than me, but you'll notice that index finger of his is actually turned way, way, way over. He's getting a ton of power that way. And you notice the whole system works that way. That he's never bowing like this, trying to transfer any sort of arm weight into that stick. He's here. Now, now to, to talk a minute about you know, the, why the arm weight thing uh, is such a popular idea is that I think people started to talk about arm weight because they wanted to figure out a way to communicate to a student who is really, really tight that they can't produce power, any sort of power on the cello by, really tight, by, by being really tight. And I would completely agree with that idea. But I think that this search for less and less and less tension in playing can actually produce uh, some, some strange results. See, I think what we need is we need to be able to use our muscles and our bodies in a way to produce power that is efficient and actually does what the string needs in order to actually have it sound powerful, you see? So of course the string needs certain stimulus in order for it to sound powerful. And we need to figure out how to use our bodies in order to produce that um, and in such a way that doesn't injure ourselves. So ideas of arm weight, I think, aren't really a, 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 a they, they might be useful to some, and I'm sure they have been useful to some, um, but ultimately I don't think it's the best way to explain actually how to produce power. Power is not only a combination of being able to produce torque and this turning feeling this way, which actually needs to increase as we approach the tip in order to get that power. But it also has a lot to do with where we put the bow on the string and, and what everything is feeling like. Do we feel like we're really pulling our sound? That, I think, is a more important idea. The idea of this, this feeling of pulling your sound back and forth and having the fingers feel passive that way. I think that's far more important than any ideas about arm weight. Now I know maybe this video will be unpopular to some of you because I know I know there there are many many uh, even of my colleagues who um, definitely use the arm weight uh, idea and and they use it and and it is effective to a certain degree. However, as I said, I don't think that it's ultimately the best way to describe exactly what's going on uh, when when power is being created. Um, uh, just one more little side point to this. If we think uh, about cellists that used to play without an end pin, for example, David Popper uh, didn't play without an end pin, and all the reports are is that his sound was quite large um, in the hall. Um, how in the world, if you're holding the cello with your legs, you know, because they held between the legs with no end pin, how in the world then are you going to be holding the cello like this and use that kind of arm weight. So you're going to have to immediately start thinking about where you're putting the bow, how to create torque, and all the things that I've already talked about. And that's, I think, one of the another reasons why this this arm weight concept didn't really start to get really popular until about the last 30 or 40 years or so. Um, so anyway, I hope there's lots of comments and lots of questions with this because I know this is kind of a heated topic and. I've kind of been avoiding it, um, but uh, um, I hope uh, uh, I hope I see a bunch of comments. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, please um, uh, uh, go to virtualsheetmusic.com and leave your comments there. Uh, I'll be happy to answer as many of them as I possibly can. Um, and uh, once again, uh, this has been Joseph Bendos uh, for virtualsheetmusic.com.